Hello, everybody. I'm Kenneth Copeland. This is the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get right into today's message. Father, we thank you with all of our hearts. Yes, we give you praise and honor. We open our hearts. We open our minds mm -hmm. for revelation from heaven, and we thank you for it. And we give you all the praise and all of the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me in welcoming Rabbi Jonathan Kahn to this broadcast? Great Praise, to be here. Sir? Great to be here. I am so glad you're finally here. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I've been looking forward to this since the first mm. day I read about half a chapter mm. of The Harbinger. And I mm. don't think I sat down a solid <laughs> until I finished the whole book. And I'm like, I'm like three or four million other people mm. that, that are in, in, mm. in this same place. Thank you. I am so blessed that you are here, sir. I am blessed to be here. I know it's been a long time in the making, but it, uh, I'm blessed and amazing what the Lord is doing. doing Let's talk about the Harbingers, I, uh, like I said, when I, it, it, at the very outset mm. of that book, so anointed, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm like millions of others. It just kind of reached out there and said, come here, Kenneth. Mm. <laughs> mm. You know, it's just, mm. I was just uh, so taken by it and still am. I've, I've been meditating mm. on it and studying mm. it now for a long time. And as you and I were talking just before the, the before we went on the air, the dominating power mm. of the Word of the Living God, mm. Mm. the timing, yes, just so exquisite, yes, is exactly. what first really took me in where the harbingers are concerned. Mm -hmm. But the next thing that that just expanded was the patience of God and the grace of God. Yes. I've believed this for years and I've had people think I was kind of crazy, but judgment mm -hmm. is a process of seed time and harvest. Mm -hmm. And it is so merciful of God if he just didn't do anything, right. it'd be, I mean, it, right. it, they're just, it, it would just devastate everything. And, That's right. and he steps in to keep that from happening. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Even in judgment is his mercy. I mean, oh, our, our, our faith is centered on the cross, which is judgment and mercy at the same time. You can't have mercy without judgment. And the other thing is that exactly, you know, people ask about America and they say, well, you know, if shaking's coming and that is that, that a scary thing? I'd say it's the opposite. If nothing happens, if it just keeps going, if the culture goes as it's going, that's scarier. Yeah. You know, it's the mercy of God that, you know, because he's against evil, but he's for. And so he always, not only that, he always warns before and he always, always calls out. And even in this, it's exactly that. It's a process because even in the last days of Israel, he shook them, but then he kept calling them, shook them, called them, gave them time, gave them more time. You know, his heart is mercy. You know, his, his necessity is to deal with evil, but his heart is mercy. That's the cross. Oh, and that's, that's exactly good. it. That is really yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. And yeah, and so the, the harbinger is a, is a, a two and a half thousand year old mystery from the Bible that literally lies behind everything from 9-11 to, uh, to the economy, to what's happening, to what has been, what is coming. I didn't look for it, Brother Copeland. I wasn't looking for a revelation. It just, it happened where, you know, there by, uh, located by uh, New York City and Ground Zero. And nor did I plan to write a book. And then when it finally happened, literally, I know we'll get it, the book just wrote itself. So, so I was kind of like an observer, you know. So the, the ultimate point is that, is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the same God of the Bible is the same God now. And he moves and he's consistent with his word. He's consistent with, with his pattern. And the, the same God who warned and called to Israel is calling to us now. That's the ultimate thing behind the harbinger. That is big. Yeah. That's big in me, and it's just yeah. getting bigger and bigger that, that his purpose is not just to uh, not just to s save 
us in the slightest, could j- just barely miss destruction. His yes. purpose is to outpour Himself in this last time that yes. overwhelms all that the devil's done for all of these it, centuries. Absolutely. You know, the, the, when people look at the, the end times, they often only focus on one part, and they focus on the dark, and that's there's there. The love of many shall grow cold. But it also says that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The gospel shall be proclaimed to all nations, and the, the lights of God will shine. So absolutely, the, old, the end game, if you can call it that, is revival. That's the heart of God. I mean, that's his heart, that, isn't it? Always. That's and, always what he's after. O- always. And most that's of us, serious. most of us, I know I can speak for myself, <laughs> did not come to the Lord unless there was some shaking. I came to the Lord because I was shaking. The last, I was an atheist. The last thing I wanted as a Jewish man, a young man, it was the Lord. I didn't want it. But the Lord shook me. He caused a train to hit me, and that is how I got saved. <laughs> so I thank, God for the tra- I thank God for the train because without that, so most of us come to the Lord through shaking. But the, the, it's the end purpose that is what God's all about. Amen. Yeah. Oh, get us in there. I, okay. I'm, I'm so excited about this. Yeah, well, there have, first of all, we start with ancient Israel. And ancient Israel is a nation that God himself ordained, God himself founded, founded on the word of God, founded on the covenant. And, and in that, they were blessed. But when they turned away from God, when they turned away from his word, the, what was to be a blessing is removed. And it turns into warning. They they started driving God out of their culture, out of their public square. They started bringing in other gods, Baal, Moloch. You know, they, they began to call what was evil good and what was good evil. They were persecuting the people of God, persecuting the prophets of God. You know, this is the times of Elijah. That's, this is the northern kingdom, which fell first. They also they promoted immorality, and they even offered their children as sacrifices to Baal and Moloch. That's how bad it got. And so, I mean, you know, the Lord is, is merciful and he's long-suffering, but you cannot mock him. And, and his, his word is real and he's real. So he warned them. He sent prophets to them, it says. It says, but they didn't listen to the prophets. They, they hardened their hearts. And so finally he allows something to happen, which is a, a, a classic pattern of judgment. And then what he did is he allowed the nation to be shaken. He allowed the hedge of protection to be lifted up temporarily to allow an enemy to come in temporarily to shake them. The, the purpose was, as we were taught, was mercy. The purpose was so that they would not be destroyed. Well, they sent his word first. Yeah. Oh, the, and they paid the no prophets. attention to that at they, all. It says they mocked. I mean, if you look at, the, look at the biblical record, this is over centuries he sent his word. I mean, he sent Isaiah, sent Micah, over to them, and again and again, Hosea, Amos, you know, he sends them, but they mock them. They mock them. And so, so only as a last resort is he finally allows this to happen. And the, even then, the purpose is mercy. Even then, the purpose is, listen, he's saying, wake up, because if you don't, you're heading to destruction. And so it was to save them from what was coming. So this happens in the year 732 BC, when the Assyrian Empire comes in, the hedge is lifted up, and they wreak havoc in Israel, and it's, the nation is shaken. But instead of returning to God in repentance, instead of coming back, which is the purpose, they respond with defiance. And I mean, these are, these are hardened people. They defy, and the prophet Isaiah, who's in the south, he records what they said. And this is the key verse with a harbinger. And this is what begins it. Isaiah 9, 10. You know, people know Isaiah 9, Brother Copeland, for, for the Christmas part, because it's unto us a child shall be born. All that's there. And that's, but then it goes on, and this is what it says. Isaiah 9, verse 8 says this. The Lord sends a word to Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. And all the people will know it, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in the pride and arrogance of heart, and here's the thing, the bricks have fallen, talking about the attack, mm-hmm. but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them, or we will plant cedars in their place. Now, if you just looked at this, you'd say, wow. If you didn't look at the context, you'd say, well, hey, this is, this is a great thing. It's about encouragement. No, it's not. What God is saying is the people who were being woken up by God, instead of responding with repentance, they respond with defiance. They God, you're not going to humble us. You're not going to, you're not going to make us come back to you. We're going to come back stronger oh, without you. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to, you know, you, you know, the bricks fell. We're going to take bigger stones and we're going to put them and we're going to build higher and bigger. We're going to do it. We're going to do we're it on, on our own strength yeah. without you, yeah. and we're going to continue going this way. 
So that's the first thing. And then they say, well, the sycamores fell, but we're going to take another tree stronger and plant it to show you we cannot be stopped. We're coming back stronger than ever. And so this is, this is a, it's a prophecy within it. And these are, from this come the nine harbingers, from this vow that brought judgment. And as they did, if you go on for the rest of the chapter, it goes on saying, okay, because they did this in arrogance, now will come this, now will come this, now will come this. So there are nine harbingers or nine prophetic signs yeah. that appear in the last days of Israel based on this, and, and the, the, they ignore them and they head to judgment. Well, the eerie thing, the stunning thing, and how true God is, the amazing thing, is those same nine harbingers of judgment warning the people, warning a nation in danger of judgment, have now reappeared on American soil. Some have appeared in a New York City, around where we are. Some have appeared in Washington, D.C. Some have involved American leaders, even the President of the United States, just as it involved the leaders back then. Some have involved objects, but they have, you know, we talk about the power of the word. Yeah. They, have, they have reappeared ex with, with, with specific fulfillment with people who don't even know what they're doing. They don't even realize they're reenacting this, but it's because God is sovereign and God is above all these things. They reenact all these harmonies all the nine harbingers have reappeared to America. Now, now the, the context here is this. What's the link? America, you know, I've said that you know, there's two nations which have been founded solely on the Word of God. Yeah. One was Israel. The other is America. The Puritans founded this nation, founded this civilization. They dedicated it to God. They said we're in covenant with God. They, they said, and they, even John Winthrop, you know, you get the famous city on the hill. And, it, you know, people say, well, well, that's what he did, but people don't read the next part. He said, if we follow God, we will be as a city on a hill. All eyes are upon us. We'll be the most blessed nation as Israel was blessed. But, he said, if we turn away from God, then the same judgment that came on Israel will come here on us. Well, that's what he said. Well, America, as much as it followed God, was the most blessed nation on earth. I mean, used of God, mightily of God, as much as it followed, as much as it said the gospel, sent the gospel to the world, also was a haven for the Jewish people. God gives a promise on that. So we've become the most blessed nation, but in our blessings, as with Israel, we made the same mistake the culture has, turning away from the God of its foundation. And instead, in driving him out of the school system, driving him out of the culture, driving him out of the public square, driving him out of government, saying you can't even say the name, taking the Ten Commandments down, that's pretty much what Israel did. All these things, and, and in the same way, we have also called what is evil good and what is good evil, just like the prophet said. And we have also, people say, well, you know, well, Israel offered up their children on the, on the altars of Baal and Molech. Well, we have, we have killed over 55 million children. Mm. I mean, how do you come, I mean, and, and, you know, God is not mocked and God, and that's the, that's the sin that, you know, Jeremiah goes out to the, to the, the gate and he has a, he has a jar and he smashes it and says in front of the field where they killed their children, he said, because you did this, you know, th there's blood on your hands. And so God, again, is merciful, long suffering, but he's not mocked. And he, in the end, his word comes true. So here in the same way, the harbingers begin appearing to America and the first harbinger, the classic sign of the warning of God in the Bible not only happens with, with the northern kingdom, it happened with the southern kingdom, that years before judgment, what happens, there's a warning sign. God temporarily lifts up the hedge of protection, that, that a shaking comes to bring the nation back, to wake up the nation to come. Mm -hmm. In America's hedge of protection was lifted up, the breach, it's called, the first harbinger, on September 11th, the Lord allowed, there was, there was it, it, uh, an attack comes to shake, to wake up. And if you remember, Brother Copeland, people from all over America were flocking to churches. I mean, flocking, flocking. I, in fact, I've never seen anything like it. Most of, when, most of us thought, well, there's going to be revival. Well, there wasn't a revival because, I mean, among the, the, the nation, because there was no repentance. And if without repentance, you don't have revival. They just got mad. They got mad. Yeah. They, got, they said, God bless America, God bless America, great. But it was about America blessing God. You know, you know God said, you know, if you don't change your course, you don't change your destiny. You know, if you don't change where you're going, you have the outcome. So what happened is the culture, instead of growing closer to God, grew farther from God. Look where we are now. This mm. is after 9-11. So here, so now, the, the, again, the, the eerie thing or the, 
or the, you know, as we say, you talk about the dominating power, is that all these harbingers begin to appear, warning. First one is that breach. Okay, but then what happens is American leaders start responding the same way the leaders of ancient Israel responded, the same way. And the, the, it starts one after the other. For instance, the second harbinger in the book is it's called the terrorist. Now, people don't realize terrorism, actually all terrorists, they all come from one people. And you can read it in the history books. They come from a people who are mentioned in the Bible, and those are the Assyrians. The Assyrians, the Assyrians were the first terrorists. I in, learned the, that from you. It's absolutely, you, you, absolutely. They that, in, uh, that's an eye-opening thing, too, when you go back, uh, like that just uh, turned me to that, to, to know wh what was behind all Yeah. That. It is such an eye-opener. Yeah. The same thing same from the thing. same people. Same people. Same ah. people. And they are you, they're in the Bible, and they're mentioned by the prophets. And every terrorist, doesn't matter, has traced themselves from Assyria. The Assyrians invented terror. And terror, as terrorism, meaning to use terror to make people do what you want or to, or to terrorize the people so you can do it. Now, the Assyrians are horrible people. I mean, the, I'm talking about, not talking about the modern Assyrians, but the ancient Assyrians, what they did was they, they used terror. They would, so much so, that when they would come to a city, the city would just surrender without any, without any fight because of the terrorists. They're the same people, Brother Copeland, that when you read Isaiah or you read about Hezekiah, when he's in the city of Jerusalem and they're surrounded and, and they're taunting him, saying, we're going to destroy you, they're the Assyrians. That's and they're saying, no. Nobody stands before us. They're what they're using is psychological warfare and terrorism. So, but uh, but Isaiah says, no, no, we're going to trust in the Lord, and and an angel comes down, and that's it. So, but the thing is that so they are the ones behind in Isaiah 9:10. They were the ones who went into the nation and made this strike of terror on the land. This one strike, and then it was over. Well, here's the thing. 9-11 wasn't just an attack. It was a strike of terror, number one. Number two, the people of 9-11, the, 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 they came from the Middle East the same place as the ancient Assyrians. They, in fact, something that, you know, they come from that same region. And, you know, when the Assyrians were carrying out this attack on the land, they were speaking Akkadian. That's their language. Akkadian is dead. But there's one language in the world today that is the, the equivalent of Akkadian, the sister language, that's Arabic. The, the, the same language of the attack of the Assyrians was the same language that carried out 9-11, the ancient Assyrians. Wow. And then, then we are brought into, where you know, we, we, America was drawn into this conflict in Iraq because, through 9-11. Iraq is ancient Assyria. It's us, the same land of the Assyrians. When, when, the, when the soldiers were walking in, American soldiers, they were passing descendants of the Assyrians who brought Isaiah 9, 10, that same thing. You know, in fact, in fact uh, you know, Mosul, which is one of the places which, which was mm -hmm. the, the, the theater of war, is ancient Nineveh. This is the capital of Assyria. It's, that, it's behind Isaiah 9, 10. Same people, same everything. So you have even that replaying in the 21st century. I mean, how consistent this is. The next, the next harbinger, I'm only doing it quick, but you know, the next harbinger, it says the bricks have fallen, they said. The bricks have fallen. Well, the, the sign of the attack, the sign of, the, of, the, of this was literally the rune heaps. When they looked around, their buildings had been destroyed. The collapse of buildings was the sign of what happened then. They looked at the rune heap, heaps and, and that's what they saw. So the bricks have fallen, meaning buildings were falling. It, the, the key sign of 9-11 was that exact, the exact sign of the harbinger. The falling of great buildings, the falling That really of, marked that attack, didn't it? it? Absolutely. That, that's what stunned everybody, everybody was to see those towers just fall in on themselves. The bricks have fallen, the exact my, sign. My, my. And even in the, and, and then the runes of 9-11, of in those runes were actually the bri actually literally bricks. And I'll, t I'll share something I've never, sh I've not shared because it just was this weekend. Turns out, I'm going to share about another scripture that was found in Ground Zero as, as we do it. But there was, an, there was a scripture, another scripture I did, that was found in Ground Zero, and I was just looking at it this weekend. It was fused to the metal, and you know what it was? It had words from the Sermon on the Mount on it, but the key words, the last words there, was when Messiah, Jesus, talks about the collapse of a building. And it was right there in Ground Zero. He says, he talks about the building that was not built on the Word of God, on the rock. And so it says the storm came and it fell, it collapsed, and great was its fall. That was the scripture that was, that was in ground zero, fused to the runes. Oh.
I just, I just looked it over, it was just this weekend, so nobody's, heard, but absolutely the Word of God, I mean, in all things. Now, now, so every single thing, and it's not that what we're gonna see, it's gonna get even more uh, eerie or amazing, but we're gonna see leaders of America reenacting without realizing what they're doing. And, and it's not that anybody is trying to make these things happen. Nobody is, nobody is. And, and you're gonna see also that the leaders don't even know what they're doing. No, they didn't they have, have no any idea. idea. Have no idea. Yet you're gonna see them pronounce this word on America as it was in ancient Israel. You're gonna see even the President of the United States do it. I mean, it's gonna happen all over because God is sovereign and because God is merciful and he does not act without warning and without calling us back. Oh, my, my. And we've just done three. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just done three. <clears throat> that, um, the timing of it, well, when it, it's, it's simple to understand when you stand back and look at it. Here's the nation of Israel. Here is the United States. And God established both. They're both under the same mandate because mm. they were created by the Creator. Mm. And so both judgments and both activities are exactly the same. Yes. Does that let yeah. us know what's in God's heart or not? Yes. I mean, that lets us know what he had in mind when he established the United States. He doesn't see two, he sees one. To be a light to the world, to be a light to the world. And God, it's the same God is alive, the same God is well, the same God is on the throne, no matter what. You know, Americans say we're not under God, we're still under oh, God. Oh, yes, we still, are. God is there, yes, God is real, <laughs> God is awesome. Praise God. Mm. We're in the midst mm. of the grandest outpouring that's ever happened to this planet. Mm. And for God to be so gracious to allow you and me to be here right now and, and to be involved in what he's doing is just beyond my imagination. I, but I'm so thrilled to have you here at this time. My it's marvelous. My, my blessing. And I'm still amazed that God can involve any of us. You know, what an <laughs> honor to be part of this program. And I want, I want to say this for this whole audience. One of the things that thrills me beyond measure is to have a Jewish rabbi on this broadcast and give me the opportunity to show you and every Jew on this planet how thrilled we are mm. to be a part. Mm. I, if, if it hadn't have been for you, there would never have been a me mm. because Christianity owes its existence to the Jews. Mm. And our voices have been quiet far too long. Well, it, it's mutual because, you know, for, it's like Ruth and Naomi, you know, and Ruth, there's a whole thing with that. Ruth, you know, was the Gentile. She's blessed through Naomi to come in, but through Ruth, Naomi is blessed. So, so it says, you know, salvation went to the world, went to the Gentiles, also to bless that we can come back. You know, so, you know, you know, it's a beautiful love story. You know, the non-Jewish person the Gen has come in through the Jewish people that the Jewish people can come in back through them. So it's the love of you and the love of God's people, which hasn't always shown in church history, but it's showing now. It is. That is the love that, is. and the prayers that have brought us back. You know, I came back, there were people who were praying, there were people who, part of it was also Hal Lindsey and, you know, the late great planet Earth. Sure. They were, they, they were faithful people to keep the torch burning. This is Israel's torch for everybody, but they kept it burning so we can come back. And so one is not complete without the other. It's like, it's like a marriage. It's like man and woman that want, they're different and they're the same and they're one, you know, one completes the other. So we're, us coming back, you know, that's part of the closing act. You know, there's a closing of God's thing and, and without, one without the other is, is something's missing. The Jewish people without the gospel, something's missing. And the church without its Jewish roots is some, there's something oh, missing. Yeah. The Israel and the church have to come together. Isn't it and, wonderful? And it's coming. Yeah. It's so yeah, wonderful. It Praise is. God. It is. Get us back okay. in here, <laughs> Rabbi. Let's get back into the 
Okay. Where we're, uh, yeah, okay. Go. Just, as, just <laughs> to set the stage in a, in a nutshell, we're looking at the the mystery of the harbinger, which is the last days of ancient Israel went away from God. There was a strike on the land that God allowed that that to warn them, shake them up, and then the harbingers of judgment, warning them, are appearing in the land. And then the parallel is God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And today, now in America, the same harbingers are appearing, warning, calling us, beginning with 9-11 and going forward. So right exactly now- Exactly the same. Oh. Happening with specific That's eerie so fulfillment. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's, we got up to three, <laughs> you know, and so, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the fourth one in the book. And the, and the fourth one is the tower. And here, here's the thing. You know, the, the people after the attack in ancient Israel, they said, you know, the bricks are fallen. Isaiah records what they said. We will rebuild with hewn stone. In other words, they're saying, we're going to build bigger. You know, bricks, you can go up so far, but hewn stone, you can go to the sky. Way. So that, so that's, so they, they say, we're going to rebuild and we're going to build bigger, better than ever. So what happens is they start rebuilding to show basically man and God, we're not going to be humbled. We're going up without God. And the thing is that when you look at the, there's a, a version of the Bible called the Septuagint, which yes. is, which you know, which is the first translation ever made of the Bible. In fact, the New Testament quotes from it all the time. It, it's the Greek version made by rabbis for the Greek speaking Jews. This is before the New Testament. And so in that version, when they got to this vow of judgment, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn or quarried stone. They translated it this way. The bricks have fallen. Come, let us build for ourselves a tower. Now, where did they get that from? They got it from Babel. They got it from Genesis 11. And they, they saw the connection between Babel, a tower of defiance going up, and Isaiah 9:10, where a, a nation in defiance says, we're coming back stronger, going to build a tower. Well, the, here's the, what happened after 9-11. American leaders start saying the same things that the leaders of ancient Israel said. I mean, the same things. And they start saying, we're going to rebuild bigger, stronger, better, higher, taller. And they even say, we're, we're going to, some very famous people said, we're going to build a tower that's going to be, a, it's going to be defiant. It's going to show the world we are defiant. Didn't they call it that? They, they literally use the words of that. They literally use the word defiance, the same words that you find in the commentaries of Isaiah 9, 10 all the time. They're doing what ancient Israel did. And, you know, it wouldn't be wrong to build, but without God, that's the problem. That's is, the whole thing. That's the, the issue. You they, can't do they it They didn't yourself. say, by your grace and help, we'll rebuild. No, they said, we're going to do it, and we're going to be stronger and bigger. Without you. Really yeah. in defiance of God himself. Just like, just like the same spirit of Babel. You know, the, 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 the tower going up. And the thing is, really, if you look in the Hebrew, you know, it says at the beginning of this, this vow in Isaiah, it says, the people say in pride and arrogance of heart. Well, the word in Hebrew for the arrogance is the word, is the word gadal. Now, gadal means arrogance, pride, but also from that word, you get the word tower. The very Come word. On. The word in Hebrew, hmm. migdal for tower, comes from Pride, pride, the same thing from Babylon. So even it's even in there in the Hebrew. I mean, not only in the Greek, in the Septuagint, it says we're going to build a tower. In the Hebrew, it's linked to pride. We're going to build a tower. So here this tower goes up. So what happens in, on, on Ground Zero is they, they start rebuilding, saying we're going to show we're coming back stronger. Well, not only do they start doing, but they actually build a tower. And the whole thing about this tower is that it, they say it's going to be it's got to be bigger and stronger than the one before. It's got to be taller, and it's going to show the world of our defiance. Well, now, I didn't realize this. You know, when I originally started seeing this with the Harbinger, I didn't realize this, but there was, a, in fact, I don't even know if it's in the Harbinger. There, there was a scripture hidden in Ground Zero that, that a guy, the official photographer, saw it, and he took a picture of it. They whisked him away because it was dangerous. He went out, he looks at his camera, looks at the picture, and when he sees the picture, he breaks down and weeps. What was on the picture was one page of the Bible you could see, and the scripture was, come let us build for ourselves a tower embedded in ground zero. The words of Babel right there and the words of Isaiah 9:10, the harbinger scripture in the Septuagint right there where the tower was going to go up. So here, America builds a tower without God to show the world that we are stronger with and without God as 
America in that time has been moving away from God and yet saying that's a bad combination. That's oh, a dangerous that's combination. Deadly, man. And there's more. And one of the things we won't do it now, but because one of the things about the Harbinger is that they haven't stopped. They've continued to manifest. So we're going to see something as we go later about what's happened since that has to do with that tower right now. But now we'll go to the next, the next Harbinger. The next Harbinger is this. They said, the bricks have fallen. We will rebuild with hewn stone. Now, that, the, the, the word in Hebrew, of course, they didn't speak English, is gazit stone. Gazit stone is a massive rectangular block of stone, not bricks, not clay. They, they quarry it out of the quarries of Israel. They go up to the mountains, build this gigantic thing, bring it back to the ground where this all happened, where the bricks fell, and they say, this is, this is the symbol that we're coming back bigger because this is bigger, this is stronger. So here is the stone. I sometimes call it the stone of judgment. This is the stone of their defiance. So they begin the building with these gazit stones. All right, now. What happens after 9-11? The people of New York go up to the mountains of New York. They quarry out a stone. The stone is a gigantic 20-ton rectangular block of stone. It's a biblical gazit stone. According to the mystery, this stone has to go back to ground zero where the bricks had fallen. They bring it back to ground zero, bring it to New York City, bring it to ground zero. They lower it down where the bricks had fallen. This is a gazit stone as in the prophecy of Isaiah. They have a ceremony around the stone. They have leaders of New York and New Jersey pronouncing vows of, of defiance over the stone as in the same spirit as in Isaiah 9, 10. In fact, the governor of New York says this. He says, we are doing this in the spirit of defiance, literally says the words. Mm. If you look at the, the commentaries on this, Brother Coleman, on Isaiah 9, 10, you'll see again and again, the commentaries will say, this is all done in, quote, the spirit of defiance. Well, they actually said it as they laid this gazit stone, the stone of judgment, at ground zero. That is the, the, the beginning of that tower. So not only you have the tower, you've got the very word, the very actual thing from Isaiah. But the next thing it says, the bricks have fallen, we will rebuild with hewn stone. And then it goes on, Isaiah records, the sycamores have been struck down. Now, what happened is when the Assyrians moved in, that first strike, that warning, not only did they devastate the buildings, but the other sign was uprooted trees. They left the land in, in devastation, the, the, the trees fell. Sycamore, now the, the word in, actually the word in, in Hebrew is shakam. When it means the fig mulberry tree. Now, when you put that together in Greek, fig mulberry becomes sucus moros, you get sycamore. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. how you get it. Yeah. So the sycamores have fallen, and most, most translations will say that. Some say fig, but that's it. So the sycamore tree as well. Now the, the falling, the striking down of trees, as you know, in the Bible, again and again, is a sign mm -hmm. of warning of judgment. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the uprooting, God says to Israel, listen, I planted you. I'm the one who planted you. You cannot defy me and turn away from everything and expect to still be standing. You'll be uprooted. And that's the warning. The, the, the tree falling is a warning of uprooting, and that's exactly what would happen to Israel, would be taken away, uprooted from the land. So it's a warning, a biblical sign of warnings, particularly the sycamore. You know, the first, the first sign of national judgment with Egypt, the first thing we have, it says the sycamores were struck. I mean, same sign, the striking of the sycamore. So here's the big That is so amazing. Yeah, I mean, God is so consistent. And so the question is, could this sign, this harbinger have appeared in New York City? Now, if you're looking for trees, the first place you, don't, you go to is not New York City. You don't expect that. But here's what happened. When the last tower comes down, it stri a, a beam goes forth or the force goes forth, it strikes an object near the tower right near the tower. And what the object is, is a tree. The tree that it struck was a sycamore tree. A sycamore, the same biblical sign of judgment at ground zero is struck by the tower, literally by 9-11. So not only the, the towers fall on 9-11, but the tree falls on 9-11. Same, same word, that tree is literally named after the tree in Isaiah 9-10. Oh struck my. down the people of New York, they think it's a good, they, they make a, a sign of it, they put it on display, the, the uprooted sycamore, they put it on display, call it the sycamore of ground zero. People from all over come to visit this uprooted tree, having no idea that this is a biblical sign of warning and judgment of a nation that was planted by God's grace and yet turned away, warning, you cannot turn away from that and expect those blessings to continue, but the warning of uprooting, in fact, in that, the uprooted tree, and actually that was the thing that I first saw when I was at Ground Zero, and I saw that tree, that's when something said, and my inside said, 
you have to seek, this is, a, this is a mystery here, you have to find it's the first piece. And if you look there, you'll find that what they had when they had it on display, they had the uprooted tree and they had the tree, inside the tree was a, was a brick. You know, it says the bricks are fallen and the, sick, and the tree has fallen and the same, they were together, in the roots of the tree was a fallen brick. I mean, literally, Isaiah oh, in Ground man. Zero. You know, so, so, and we were talking about exact things, and it goes on. God just wrote his name all over that. Be, he's cons- For us yeah. to see and, and understand. Yeah. We got to get this straight. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think people say, well, what? Well, God is specific, and to, to put his mark, he uses his word, yes, and this sir. is his word, you know. And so you have that. Then it goes on. Isaiah says, the people said, the, the sycamore has been struck down. We will plant cedars in their place. Now, here's the thing. They start, this is another act of defiance. They say, okay, you're not humbling us, just like we're gonna build bigger. We're gonna take a stronger tree and we're gonna plant it right where the sycamore has fallen to show you we're coming back stronger. We're gonna blossom like this tree. The tree they choose, the Bible, most Bibles will say cedar and, it, it, and that's a good translation, but there's more to it. They take the, the, the in Hebrew, it's the word erez, erez tree. Erez tree can be a cedar, Literally, but it also literally means a, a pine, an evergreen. Um, it literally means panacea tree. That's the best kind of thing of it. It can be a cedar, but it can be anything that is of this family. And the thing is that what it, what it means in Hebrew, the word erez literally means strength. So they're saying strength. So the sycamore, okay, but we're putting, we're planting it right in its place. This, they're performing a ritual act. They're kind of showing God, it's like in his face, saying right where it fell, we're planting this other tree. Well, well, in Hebrew, it's the act of halaf. It means to put a tree where another tree had fallen. Now, that's what happened. What happens to America? Two years after 9-11, a tree appears in the sky. It's literally being lowered down to earth and it's going into the exact spot where the sycamore of ground zero stood and was struck down on 9-11. They plant, they're performing the ancient act of halaf, the ritual act that Israel did, now America's doing it. Nobody knows what they're doing, nobody's trying to make it happen, it's just happening. They put it down, the tree in, in the place, they have a ceremony around the tree, and when they're, in, when they're around it, they call, they, they call it the tree of hope, meaning we cannot be conquered. They said, this is the, we, are, we cannot be conquered, this is a sign. This tree is a sign, just like Israel does. And, and what kind of tree is it? I mean, it'd be natural to put a sycamore where the sycamore fell. It's not a sycamore, it is a pine tree, it is a conifer tree, it is a panacea tree, it is the Erez tree. They perform the exact act of ancient Israel. Glory to God. Nobody could have put this together. I mean, nobody. The people who did it didn't even choose. I mean, somebody donated the tree, didn't know. The terrorists certainly aren't reading Isaiah 9, 10. No. no and they couldn't have planned the sycamore being fallen. I mean, this is how exact, exact God is. How he's in the details, how he's in everything. I mean, exactly. Performed at the ground of ground zero. If any element of this yes. had not matched, that's right. then it would not be so indelibly stamped with the mercy of God because he has set it up yes. so exact and so richly tuned together that any skeptic that looks at it cannot argue with it. God is saying, come on, come on, baby, straighten up now. Come on, repent over this thing yes, and yes. let me give you a new nation. Yes. Repent over this thing and let me pour my spirit out on this place. He's not trying yes. to destroy it. No, no, no. If, no, people say, well, the, listen, if there was no hope or there was no mercy, there'd be no harbingers. That's right. What's the point of warning if you're not calling? What's right. the point of warning if you can't respond? If, if, if it was any less exact, I mean, that just shows you how God is so involved. Yeah, yeah, and that, so you don't miss it, and it, it brings you right back to the scripture, because this all, you know, I didn't know when I, when I was, when I was on ground zero and this began and I, and I saw that tree, I mean, I had no idea where this was going, you know, and, and something says, look, search this out. There's something there. 
Immediately I'm led to Isaiah 9.10. Now, because now, you, you, you can go on a concordance. It's going to lead you right here to Isaiah 9.10, which is telling you, and, and the same scripture we were talking off the air, that David Wilkerson, the, the week after 9-11, says this is, this is from God. He didn't know about the tree. He didn't know about these things. But, and, the, and, the, and these things were only discovered, I mean, this happened right after 9-11. Most people didn't even know about this. And so, so it's bringing you to the same word. And the word that it's bringing you to, just these harbingers, is the word of what happened, what God gave to Israel when it was falling in danger of judgment. And the example we have, you know, the Bible says, these are all examples for us. You know, what happened to Israel is an example to all of us. And that's exactly what happened in Israel's last days and when it turned away. But God is saying it's his mercy that says, I don't want that to happen. It's his mercy that warned them then. It's his mercy that warns us now. Absolutely. And he's saying, he's saying, I want life. Choose life. Choose life. But he's making it very specific. And, it, and it's even, Brother Copeland, it's even going to get more specific. Because, because what happened next, I don't think we'll have time now, but what happened next is that when I, I literally was on the computer and I'm, I'm typing in Isaiah 9:10, and instead of get, instead of showing me the verse of Isaiah 9:10, it takes me to Capitol Hill and reveals something I had no idea of. Not only were all the harbingers leading to Isaiah 9:10, but actually God was going to cause this scripture to be proclaimed from Capitol Hill, sign of judgment. Talk about exact. Oh my my my! Where are we, Tim, on time? Oh, my goodness. Now get your time stretcher out there and let <laughs> <laughs> This is so important. Now, now get this. Don't ever be frightened of judgment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the person, the man or woman, that lives by faith, when God corrects us, it's because if we continue to live by faith and walk by faith and not by sight, we never have to change our lifestyle because the surroundings are changing. The economy is changing. We, we accept our correction. We stay in line. We're, in, we're, we're walking in the kingdom of God. We're walking with Him. We're walking through all of this rubble, praise God, because there's an outpouring at hand that's beyond anything this planet has ever seen. And all of this, I'm convinced, all of this, these are birth pangs to the rebirth of this nation, a new nation under God. And I don't believe anybody yet knows what it's going to look like, only God. And it's going to be the best thing that ever happened here. Mm. The, the mercy of God leads to repentance, you know. And if you remember, we, we alluded to it in the first program, but that, that you know, we saw the glimmers after 9-11, the, the a shadow of what could have been the greatest revival. We saw people going to church who never went to church. We people talking about God who never talked about God. We saw what it could look like. You know, the missing thing was repentance. And now I believe, one of the reasons why I believe the Lord gave the harbinger is that that when the next things come, we're not unprepared. He's putting it That's together. Right. You know, people, when anybody talked about God after 9-11, they were shouted down. You know, I mean, when they said, okay, is God warning us? Shout it down. But I believe he's warning now, putting it together, that when it happens, we cannot ignore it. And we cannot ignore it except either say yes or no to God. And God That's is That's the effect it had on me. Yeah. And particularly the, the, the deeper I got into your book, the more I realized that like uh, my spiritual father back there years ago when this happened, he said, this is a wake up call. Well, I believe we're waking up all over this country. Pray. We need it. My, this has been so wonderful. Uh, let's don't even talk. Get us right back in here. I, <laughs> okay. I'm so thrilled over all this. It just, it, 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 the more it goes in my spirit, it's just going off mm. like this, you know, mm. just go from one place of the word to the other. It is so exciting. Yeah, yeah. And what, so and what happens between shows should be on the show too. Yeah. This is all that's happening. <laughs> the, the, well, for those just to bring up to speed, here's the thing. Ancient Israel, uh, it is the 700s BC. God warns them. They're away from God. God warns them. It gives them signs. It gives them harbingers. And these are the nine harbingers of warning. They reject them. And, we, and the thing is, the same harbingers are now reappearing in America. And what we have seen step by step, we saw the breach. We saw the sign of the, the terrorist. We saw the, the harbinger of the fallen bricks, the fallen buildings, the harbinger of the tower, the harbinger of the 
the Gazit stone, the stone of judgment, then the harbinger of the sycamore, the fallen sycamore, and then the Erez tree, the, the tree of judgment. So that's where we are. Now, what happens next is even to me more eerie because I was, we were sharing before when, when, when I was standing at Ground Zero and the Lord first started speaking to me about this and, and I, I was immediately led to Isaiah 9:10, having no idea mm -hmm. what was going to come, mm -hmm. had no idea. But what happens, I'm seeing all the harbingers of Isaiah 9:10, and then one day I am typing into my computer Isaiah 9:10. I'm expecting to get the scripture. Instead of getting the scripture, it brings me to the annals of Congress. And all of a sudden, for the first time, I'm, I mean, I'm blown away. I remember telling my wife, I said, you won't believe what this is that Isaiah 9:10 is not something just here it is something that God caused to fall upon the nation. It starts out in this scripture it says God says the it says the Lord sends a word and that word falls upon Israel and all all the nations shall know it. So here's what we're going to see now. One of the signs the eighth harbinger in the book is the sign of the utterance. And the thing is in the last days of Israel the leaders of Israel had to have made this vow, and I'll read it just for those who, who don't know. Sure. In Isaiah 9:10 says, they after this, after this attack, they respond with defiance. They say this. They said, The bricks are fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will plant cedars in their place. So here is the vow they made that brought judgment. But it had to be, the leaders had to have said this because. A leader is one who speaks for the nation. Mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. leader is the one who charts the course of the nation. So if the people said it, that's fine. But the leader had to say it for this to be representing the nation. So it means in, in the capital city of Samaria, that's where they were in the Northern Kingdom, the leaders had to have made it publicly, public statement in the capital. And it even talks about Samaria in the beginning. It mentions about those, it says, those it says the inhabitants of Samaria, capital city, that mm -hmm. say, and the, and the nation, that say in pride and arrogance of heart. So they say it. So lead it. And then when they said it, they're trying to say, this is a good thing. We're coming back. But God is saying through Isaiah, no, no, no. You're spoken a word that is against God. This is a judgment on you by pronouncing it, uttering the power of what they, saying this, this, this vow is going to bring judgment. So now here's the question. Could this harbinger, because this would mean a leader, an American leader, giving utterance to this vow of defiance and judgment in the capital city, could this have happened in America? Now, the thing is that any, for any politician to speak judgment, I mean, to speak a vow, I mean, crazy. I mean, anybody running for office, who in their right mind is going to do this? And especially not someone running for office. But here's what happens, Brother Coburn. Three years after 9-11, on the anniversary of 9-11, so it's all about this, this context, a man gets up in Washington. He is running for vice president. He's a famous senator, John Edwards, gets up before a congressional caucus, and he speaks about 9-11. And at the beginning, as he opens up, he says, we have this word now for us now. And then out of his mouth, out of the mouth of John Edwards, he says, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will plant cedars in their place. He's actually uttering this vow of mm. judgment, defiance, destruction, and he doesn't know what he's doing. He has no idea. Out of 30,000 verses in the Bible, he goes to this one, which most even believers didn't even know this, this verse. It's an obscure verse. No, it's obscure. Nobody, and yet this is what the leaders of ancient Israel did. Now here's a leader in America. It's like replaying, replaying the drama. The, 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 you talk about the power of the word, to replaying this exactly without knowing. He says it. And so by doing so, without knowing, he's identifying America now is in this context. He's speaking about 9-11. And he doesn't even realize this, this verse is specifically about the strike that comes as a warning from God of a oh nation my. that is in danger of judgment. He doesn't know it, but he's linking it together. He's linking America as a nation that has known God, but now is falling from God in danger of judgment. And he's doing it on 9-11. He doesn't know about the harvest. He doesn't know about the bricks. He doesn't know about the, the tree. He doesn't know, about, but he's saying he it. He just picked a verse to say what he wanted to, to say. say. Without having, talk about context, having no idea of context, he says it, and not only that, but he builds his entire speech, the entire speech, 
on Isaiah 9:10. The entire speech, he goes on to say, we're going to talk about the sycamores. He said, where those sycamores fell. He doesn't, re he doesn't realize that actually there was one. He says, where the sycamores fell, we will plant cedars. We will plant the Aaron's tree. He doesn't realize it's happened. He says that where the, where the bricks fell, we're going to plant the, the hewn stone. That he doesn't realize it's happened, but he's saying it all. The whole speech is Isaiah 9, 10. Someone can read it. The entire speech is that. Now, how does that happen? Now, the, the amazing thing is, you know, when you look at in, in, the, in the New Testament, it has a time when Caiaphas actually says something yeah. and he doesn't realize what he said. He didn't realize what he has was no saying. no idea, but it says he did not say it of his own. He said he's basically plotting murder. And he says, you know, it, it's necessary that, that one man dies plotting murder that the whole nation won't perish. Well, what the, what the New Testament, what John says in writing this by the Spirit says, he didn't say it of his own. He didn't know what he was saying. He, he said it, it was actually by the Spirit. The Spirit was saying one man will die so the, so the nation can be saved, but he didn't know it. So there's a double thing going on. He's saying it, what he's thinking, but God is doing something prophetic at the same time. Yeah. And what yeah, it says, sure. it, it says that he did it because he held that office. It was the office of high priest. He did, didn't he? That's the why office. he did it. That's the, why he did it. And the, it's the high priest who actually It actually offered, made it official between, yeah. he, uh, yes. between heaven and earth. He's representing the nation. Yes, He's speaking for the nation. And the high priest would actually be the one who would offer up the sacrifice. So even that's part of it, too. So here it is, an example of unwitting prophecy, where he says it, and it's by inspiration, but it's not the regular way. It's in spite of himself. It's a judgment thing, but God does that too. So now you have John Edwards, who is a leader of the, of, in the nation, who is a senator, who is running for, he's speaking, and what he comes out of his mouth, he means it one way. But God is meaning it another way. It is a, he means it, hey, look, everybody, we're coming back, which is exactly what the leaders of ancient Israel did. But it's a prophetic statement said, which is saying, it's linking everything together, saying, it's like, say, wake up, people. Isaiah 9, 10, God mm -hmm. is warning it's mm -hmm. all happened. So here this happens. He still has no idea what he said. It's said in the capital city, but that's not all. Because the, the ninth harbinger in the book is that, is the, is, the, is the prophecy, and that is that somebody, not only did a leader have to say this, but a leader had to have said it right after the event because he's speaking about what we will now do. This is what we're going to mm -hmm. do. It's pro he's speaking, we're going to rebuild, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, that's what we're going to do. And then it gets recorded by Isaiah, so doubly it becomes prophecy because it's in the prophetic word, it's in the prophetic record, the annals of the nation, where Isaiah is saying, this is not a prophecy of coming back, this is a prophecy of judgment. So you have all, it becomes a prophecy. One, that it's spoken right after the event, this is what we're going to do, and they did it. And two, that it becomes, from the record of Isaiah, becomes a prophecy. Now, could somebody have spoken this right after the event? Also from the capital city, a leader. Well, here is what happens. And most of us missed it at the time, but it's really mind-boggling. What happens is the, the, uh, the entire nation or the, the leaders gather on Capitol Hill day after 9-11. This is September 12th, day after 9-11. They gather on Capitol Hill to give literally America's response to what happened. So this is like prophetic. It's going to be America's response. The man who's appointed to do that is the leader of the Senate. Now, the Senate, it represents the, the states, the nations. He's representing the Senate. <clears throat> so like the high priest, he is literally representing America. So he is the Senate Majority Leader, Tom Daschle. And he is there, and he goes up to the podium to give the nation's response at this moment. He can say anything he wants. He gives the response, presents it, and then gives a speech. At the end of his speech, as he reaches the crescendo of his speech, comes to the point, he says this. This is before every member of Congress. He says... There is a passage from Isaiah that speaks to all of us at times like this. So here, he's about he, what he's referring to, then out of his mouth, from the floor of the House of Representatives, every senator, every member of Congress, 9-11, day after, says, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. Then he speaks about the tree, he has the, he's, doing, he's naming the harbingers. Every member of Congress is hearing it. He's saying it from Capitol Hill. It's America. He's speaking for the nation, as these did. 
and he does he speaks about the tree that struck down he doesn't realize there is a literal tree that's just being discovered that day in the ruins of ground zero he speaks about the the stone that's going to go up that he, he that we're going to put this he doesn't realize this is prophecy it's going to happen it's going to happen 3 years later after he says it they're going to put that gazit stone that that hewn stone on where the bricks have fallen he said it then and then he speaks about replacing the one tree with the other, the Erez tree, it's going to happen two years later. He has no idea, but he's speaking prophetically without realizing it. So, he, and, and this is recorded in the annals of Congress. Yes, sir. This is the action that, that the response that America had through its leaders on the day after 9-11 was the exact same ancient words that were the response of ancient Israel after its attack that brought judgment. And so here he is identifying America as the nation in danger, and you talk about God speaking clearly, this went out to the entire nation and the world, Isaiah 9, 10, and he, he, he identifies it, and it's the words that the leader spoke that invoked judgment on the nation. Many of us, we were talking before, when we watched what happened after 9-11, we were thinking, okay, maybe there can be revival right now because people are flocking to churches. If we were there, if we realized what was being spoken on Capitol Hill, we would know there wasn't revival then. That that what it, that there could be now, there could be coming. We believe for that. But back then, what it was saying is that the nation right now is going to go defiant, is going to go farther from God. And at the end of his speech, that's the, almost the end. He says the very he says he says Dashiell says. That is what we will do. He's referring to Isaiah 9, 10. He literally is referring to, he says, we're, in other words, he doesn't realize he's saying it, we're going to do what ancient Israel did, which was defy God and go farther from word God. Word for word. Word for word. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, he's referring to Isaiah 9, 10. He still, to this day, I don't know if he, know what he, I don't know if he knows what he did or what he said, but it was prophetic. And so it would happen, and it's going to lead the stage for the next shakings and the further apostasy, defiance of America, that's leading to where we are now. But it was all spoken then on Capitol Hill. Oh, my, my, my. And, I mean, if that's not enough, and this is, this is, this technically what I'm going to share now, well, this happened after. We're going to bring, we're going to go to the President of the United States himself. The President who represents the nation as the President. The first speech that he gave, that Obama gave, to a joint session of Congress, first major speech was right after he was inaugurated, went to Congress about the crisis, which in the, in the Harbinger is the second shaking and also brings the Shemitah into it. We won't go into now, but he goes to Congress and he gives a speech. Now, now, Brother Copeland, the interesting thing, one of the things in the, in the Word is that when God gives a prophecy, he often gives, you will find a prophetic address. In other words, in the beginning, it's telling you very often who this is for, where it's going, what it's about. You find it in Isaiah 9.10. Before Isaiah 9.10, God says, it says, this is a word going forth to Samaria, going forth mm -hmm. to this. It mm -hmm. gives the prophetic address, the people who say with arrogance, and then it goes on. Well, the interesting thing is every time this phenomenon happens, that this warning of judgment scripture comes out to America, there's always a prophetic address before it. In other words, saying this is, this is from God, this is for now. I'll give you an example. The Tom Daschle, you know, when, when he speaks it, what does he say before he says it? He says, there is a passage from Isaiah that speaks to us, America, at times like this now, but it means times of judgment. So here he's identifying, you know, the, the thing here says, the word goes forth and all the people will hear it, or all the people will know it. Well, here it's saying this is to all America. That's before he says it. John Edwards, before he says it, he says, you know, at this time, September 11th anniversary, we have this word, we America have this word from God to bring us through. Well, he's identifying America and this is from God, okay? Now Obama goes to the, the Congress and he gives a speech about how we're going we're gonna to come back stronger, basically. Well, that's the point. If you had to take Isaiah 9, 10, and, and if you read the commentaries, they do this, Put it into regular American English, aside from, you know, you have sycamores and everything. Put it, distill it together, it's this. Number one, we will, we will rebuild and we will come back stronger. That's what it's saying. And then all the commentaries say it. Well, Obama goes there and then, and then as he gets in his speech, he says, you know, this has happened and the economy, this, all this, all this, this is. But tonight, here's the prophetic address to indicate, to alert you. Alert us. 
I want every American to know this. This is now for every American to know this word. What does he say? We will rebuild. We will, America, the United States of America will come back stronger than before. This is the paraphrase of Isaiah 9 10, and including the key verse, we will rebuild. He says it. Now, Brother Colby, if you, if you were on the computer, which I was, you know, and you typed in, we will rebuild. That's all you did. It would lead you to Isaiah 9 10. Just those three words would take you on the first page of when it tells you what's out there, would be Isaiah 9 10, would be this prophecy. We will rebuild. That's how key this is. But after the president spoke, if you type that in again, what happened was across the world, the president's words, we will rebuild for America, replaced Isaiah 9 10. It took the place of Isaiah 9 10 on the internet. If you type that in, it literally, now it was Obama's we will rebuild that replaced the leaders of ancient Israel's we will rebuild all over the world, <laughs> all over the world, all across the world, the headlines read, I mean, you can see it, Obama vows we will rebuild, Obama, we will rebuild all across the world. That's what they took out of the speech, Isaiah 9, 10, out of the whole speech, and we will come back stronger. But it literally, I mean, talk about the ancient and talk about the modern and the same God, literally the words not only went across America, went across the world, and re literally the leader of America's vow of defiance replaced the words of ancient Israel, their leaders, word for word, word for word. Now here's, and, and too, when you add, you, you, the bottom line of it is we haven't been able to rebuild. No, no. Nowhere no. close. This economy no. is no. trashed. No. And it's because Never. nobody in, no. in authority invoked God and His grace and repented. No. No, and that's it. That's it. You know, people look, and this, this can be applied personally as well, but nationally, you look at, you know, people say, well, it's a, you know, the problem is economy, the problem is military, the problem is this. No, it's not. The problem is spiritual is with God in America. It's American God. That's it. If you don't get that right, and that's, and that's really exactly what Isaiah 9, 10 is saying. They're saying, we'll do it by this. We'll do it by bricks. We'll do it by our power. We'll get back. But God is saying, no, if you don't get back with me, everything else is going to fall apart. And everything we've done backfires. You know, they tried to, they say, you know, the, the, right after 9-11, right after they said, we're going to fight this economically. So they, they slashed all the interest rates. You know, that's what they did. So we're going to rebuild it. What happened is what they did is they ended up doing the Isaiah 9, 10 principle says, you do that, you try to, you try to fix your problem without God, it's gonna come, it's gonna cause the next problem. So what happened is they actually built up a balloon, a bubble that then came crashing down in 2008. I mean, the whole thing collapsed, what they said, which is what happened to Israel. They said, we're gonna do it here, we're gonna do it by our power, but without God, you're gonna set in motion the thing, the very thing that's gonna cause the next problem. Yeah, yeah. Because the, it's like, it's like a, you know, trying to deal with a weed and and you, you know, you cut off the top, you cut off the top, that's not gonna do it. You have to get the root. The root is with God, and that's true in our life too. You know, no matter, the, the issue is with God. Get it right with God, the rest will follow. The rest will follow. But put, put God first, everything follows. Put everything else first, nothing follows. But this is the same exact thing that happened to Israel. Someone, that's the reason this, these coming elections, and not, not just the presidential election, but everything that has anything to do with these coming elections. Uh, the governors, the, the senators, the House representatives, or out down to the justice of the peace. I mean, that somebody in official capacity repents. Yes. That's yes. got to take place. Yes, yes. And I think there's a reason, you know, the Lord, one of the things since the Harvard came out, the Lord keeps opening doors for me to go to Washington more than ever in my life, to go there again and again. Actually, the book actually opened up the doors for prayer in, in Washington. And there are people, I mean, actually, I think every member of Congress has received the Harbinger. And, every, and there are people in Congress who are godly people, but they're a remnant. They're a remnant. They're not in, they're not the president. I mean, they're not, they're not the ones in the, but they're there. Some of them are running for president and they know the harbinger. And so that's what we're praying for. Because yes, you need to have a leader, a Josiah, mm -hmm. a leader mm -hmm. to speak in repentance for the nation before, and, and you know, that Josiah was one man, but he led the nation in Absolutely. revival. And that's what we need. Well, that's happened over and over again. One man. One man. And it looked impossible. But God used him in here, oh, and here he comes. Yeah. And we're, we're back there again. The only thing, the difference this time is the timing. All of these things that happened in the past were types 
and shadows yes. and all, all pointing to right now. And everything that's happening now has to come to pass. Mm. Certain things, I mean, Putin is doing certain things that have to come to pass mm. and, and all this. Right. And here we are right in this little sliver of grace time, boom, <laughs> right before this. Yes. And we're there. Yes. Yes. It's time to pray and intercede, not, not just for the nation. And hear, hear me about this. We're out of time, but I, I want to, I want to get this in there. As we pray as, as God's people intercede for the outpouring of God's glory and it's here, but as we intercede for it, we pull on it. Our faith pulls on it. In doing that, we're actually praying for this nation and for this planet. Mm. Glory to God. Amen. Man, I got to tell you, this has been an exciting time for mm. me. This My is just blessing. glorious. My blessing. God oh, is amazing. so good. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? There's no end. You know, I find there's no end to his mysteries. There's no end to how deep his word is. You know, a book is as deep as its author. There's no end to the book. There's no end to it. No, 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 no. Yeah. It's so amazing. amazing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Absolutely. And we are, we, we just, <laughs> this whole week, we've touched on the Harbingers. But one of the things we're going to do uh, is the, in the book, it's called The Mystery Ground. And this is a whole nother realm. And this is, this is this. When Israel was fully formed, you had, a, you had the king, Solomon, you had the temple was finished. The whole nation gathered in Jerusalem and they gathered to dedicate the temple and dedicate the future of Israel to God. And Solomon prayed, you read that whole, all those oh, chapters, yeah. prayed yeah, and Lord, yeah, if they yeah. fall away, do this and this happens, have mercy if they do this. And there's a whole, he's, he's praying for the nation's future again and again. And this was the dedication. Now, it was this temple mount. It was the sacred ground. It was where the prayers went up. It's where everything went up. But when later on, I mean, God was so patient. I mean, this is, this is like the 900s BC, but it, it was all the way to the 586 BC when finally judgment came. And this one, a nation went way off and he sent prophets and prophets. Finally, when the judgment came, Babylon came in, they went to the Temple Mount, destroyed the temple. The principle is that the, the destruction returns to the same ground mm -hmm. where the nation was dedicated yeah. to God. And, and the thing is, it happens there, and it's God is saying, hey, come back, nation. You know, this is where you made the covenant. This is where you were consecrated. Come back to me. Your only hope is there. So when they, they looked to the Temple Mount, they, there was a reminder from God of the covenant and a reminder that he was calling them back to come back to the foundation, back to where they were dedicated. So that's what happened. Now, could there actually be a parallel with America? Could this actually, this mystery, actually have been manifested in America? And here's the thing. America was fully constituted, you know, it was, independence was 1776, but when it became a fully constituted nation, as we know it today with a president over Congress and all that, was the year 1789. Mm -hmm. The day was April 30th, 1789. George Washington, the first president, is in the capital city. He puts his hand on the Bible and swears on the Bible to become president. He goes inside to Federal Hall, which is where the Congress was, and he delivers the first ever presidential address to America. Now, in that first ever address, often in the Bible, when you have beginning days or consecration days, you often have a prophetic warning. You have a blessing or a curse. You have that many times. Washington actually gives a prophetic warning to America. It's in the first ever presidential words. And he gives a warning of what would happen if we turn from God. And what he says is, and first of all, by the way, in that first speech, Washington gives glory to God. He says, all this came from God. Everything we have is from God. But then he says, he says this, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself hath ordained. Washington is saying, America's blessings come from God. All blessings come from God. But if America ever turns away from God and disregards the eternal rules of order and right of heaven, then the, the smiles of heaven or the blessings of God will be removed from the land. That's the warning. He gives that warning. Then the first government of America, this is Washington, House of Representatives, Senate, Cabinet, 
all go on foot to perform their first act together. Now, the first act of the American Congress together with the president wasn't to pass a bill or vote or argue. It was to pray. The very first act on the very first day was to pray and dedicate America to God and commit America's future to God. They go on foot to a place appointed to, to, for that service, for they spend about at least two hours praying and dedicating America's future to God. Now, here's the thing. This was America's consecration ground on its first day. This was the ground. If you can find out where it is, we have a mystery. Where was it? It was in the nation's capital. But the capital that day wasn't Washington, D.C. The That's capital right. was New York City, where it was, it was the lower Manhattan. It was the lower part of New York City. It was where exactly is America's consecration ground. America's consecration ground. America was dedicated to God on ground zero. Oh. Ground zero is our nation's dedication ground, our consecration ground to God. That's where it was on the first day. They were right there at ground zero. Mm -hmm. All that, the ancient mystery that, the, that the, the warning, the destruction returns to the same ground where the nation was dedicated to God in prayer. It returns there. And on that day, a shockwave goes forth from ground zero, the dedication ground, and goes to the place where wa Federal Hall, where Washington gave the warning of what would happen if we ever turned away from God. And it strikes the foundation. You know, this Federal Hall, this is the foundation of America. It strikes the foundation of the foundation, puts a crack in the foundation of America. There on that day where he gave the warning. But all around ground zero, all around ground zero, all the nations are, I mean, actually all the buildings are ruined or destroyed except one. Only one is saved. And the one that is saved is the little stone chapel. And it, it's the little stone chapel where America was dedicated to God. The only place that was spared. It was right there, right there. And, and, and buildings that were farther away got destroyed. But they say the reason why it was saved, they called it the miracle of 9-11, was that there was an object that absorbed the brunt of 9-11 and shielded the church, shielded the church. What was the object? The object was the harbinger. It was the, it was the sycamore. The sixth harbinger saved the church, saved the dedication of America. And what the, the, the message here is, the point of the harbingers is not, is not to destroy America, it's to save America. To save it's to wake up America. That is a type and shadow right there, isn't it? Yes. Of today. Yes. 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 The warning, the warning ends up saving, saving, shaking and saving the nation and protecting the church. It was the church where they were there. And so, you know, what happened is that after 9-11, and I was there, you know, there, I watched it, you know, but after 9-11, People were flocking from all over to go to that church. You know, they didn't realize nobody. It was like it was like God by by 9/11, He caused the entire focus of the nation to turn back to the ground where it had been dedicated to God. I mean, without even us knowing it, the whole it was like it was like as He did to Israel, saying, "Come back, come back, come back, return to the ground from which you have fallen, return." And you know, and that's the same ground. The, the consecration ground where the harbingers appeared. They appeared on America's consecration ground. You know, the, the, the sycamore that was struck down was growing in the soil of that church, of the consecration ground, where they put that other harbinger, the other tree. Same thing. It was all... It in was the same spot. Same, right spot. The same spot. Same spot. And, and the entire land there, even where the tower would later go up in history, that was the church's land. That was you know what? Land. I, I did, this just flashed through my spirit. Um, when Solomon was dedicating that temple and, and he, he was such, in such a high place with God and, and the nation was in such a high place with God, that was a pure day. Yes. And God is saying, come back, get back over here to that spot of purity. Come, come back to that spot. Yes. Now, that when, when Washington and all of those members of Congress and everybody that was involved in that, when they came down there and they began to pray, can you imagine what the prayers were? Yeah. Oh, they're dedicating yeah. this thing to God. Yeah. They don't know what it's going to look no. like 20 years from no. now, 100 years from now. No. They're, they're just so thrilled. They've got a place 
where we can worship God with freedom and, and they're just so filled with all of this and God is saying, come back to that. That's come right. back to that pure moment where you were when you were thrilled that this yeah. nation was even in existence. It, you know what it sounds like when you're saying that? It sounds like when God was speaking to the prophet, through the prophets to Israel and saying, remember your youth. When you remember your affection, <laughs> yes. when you ran after yes. me and you loved me, and remember when you that, were hungry, yeah, for me. yeah, you wanted to be free. Yeah, this was it. America was founded on that. Was founded on that, and they literally prayed for the future. Yeah, they didn't know what was happening. They didn't know how big this would become. They didn't know, and, and the tower that would, ha you know, when it was all happening, people didn't realize it was being built on that same ground. The tower that was representing how big America had become and and how prosperous and all that. But it was on that foundation. But the, the problem is that if you, you go and you're blessed by God, just like Israel, and you have all these blessings, but you turn away from your foundation, then the tower falls and fall. goes back to its foundation. And it goes back, the ground there is the foundation ground. You know, God said to Israel, He said, you know, I built this up, but, but if you turn, this is going to go, I'm going to bring you back to the foundation. So literally, it, so went, it went, to, went to the foundation of the tower, which was the foundation of America right there where it was dedicated to God in prayer. God is calling back, return, 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 America, return. I built you, every blessing. I'll throw something in. That, that was in that one of the things in the Harbinger, that's called the mystery ground. But something that links to this too, this is, I didn't plan on saying this now, there's a, there's a thing called the Buttonwood mystery, and what this is linked to that same area in a different way. America's financial rise to superpower began with something called the Buttonwood Agreement. And that was these people in Wall Street, before there was Wall Street, signed a covenant called the Buttonwood Agreement. It's called Buttonwood, and from this, from that, that, that moment, we rose, Wall Street began. But what was Buttonwood? Buttonwood was the tree under which they signed the covenant. So here it all begins, America and all that. Well, what was the Buttonwood? The Buttonwood is another way of saying the sycamore. The sycamore the harbinger that was fallen. And here, so here in Wall Street, Wall Street literally means that the Wall Street was originally called Buttonwood, was originally called the Sycamore Place. Here at the beginning, God's saying, I blessed you from the beginning. But if you turn away, then it falls. And so here, what happened in the same, place, same area is the sign of Wall Street, of, of all our blessings, fall, fall, because without God. And they actually, Brother Goldman, they actually, built a statue, the first statue they built commemorating 9-11 was a statue of that fallen sycamore. And they put it at the end of Wall Street. So here Wall Street was originally called the sycamore place or the buttonwood place. Now they have a symbol of an uprooted buttonwood tree saying, listen, God is the foundation. God, every blessing you have comes from, comes from me. And, but if you turn away, I can uproot just as well as I can plant. I can plant. But God is calling for God is calling for mercy, and that's the whole point. That's the point in Israel. I'm, uh, I'll throw something in that I don't, don't normally do, and it's not, in the, it's not in the book, but this is something that happened afterwards, and I didn't know. What we have ground zero was the consecration ground, but what was ground zero before America became a nation? What was it? I started looking. It was, turned out it was a land, and it, the one who kept the land, it was called the Ryerson Dye Farm. It was a farm. And the man who was in charge of it, the keeper, was a Christian. He was a, he was a believer, and he was a minister. And he wanted this to be something, but you know, he, his, name was, his name was Ryerson, Eurus Ryerson. Keeper of Ground Zero. But what happened, and let me throw this in. The sign of, of the, there's a crest for Ryerson who had Ground Zero. It has two trees on the crest. And both of the trees are uprooted. It's strange, you don't put that on a crest. One, and Ground Zero, one tree, is this, well, we won't, we won't go into it, but it's, the two, it's like the two harbingers on his crest. But let me, go, let me go further. So as New York City started growing, he said, you know, New York City is becoming too sinful. This is way back in like 1700. He said, it's too sinful. So he said, let me, let me get another land that's going to become the redemption of this. That became ground zero. But he, he, I want to do another land. So he, 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 he gets another land, moves his family, dedicates that land to God, this new land. That replaces ground zero. It's the new Ryerson Dye Farm. And actually, the man who started the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening, um, who was actually a Dutchman, he came to that little land and he prayed with Ryerson for, revi you know, for revival. But now, now, here's the thing, here's the thing. Where was that other mystery ground? Those two grounds of Ryerson were side by side for 300 years. Or were, it was not in New York, 
he crossed the river. It was in New Jersey. It was in, it was off an Indian trail. It was in the town of Wayne, New Jersey. The ground that is the other mystery ground, that was the redemption, turned out to be the ground where God led us and put our building, where the harbinger went forth to America. Our ground, the ground of Beth Israel, is the land of Eurus Ryerson. We had no idea. We had, it's the land that matches up with ground zero. And it was the land that was to be the redemption. From the first land of Ryerson came, the harbingers appeared. From the second land, the harbinger message came forth to America. Come on. We had no idea. <laughs> we had no idea. In fact, in fact, there is a, there, if you go to Ground Zero today, you'll see a, a sign that says, it was called the Ryerson Dye Farm. It still says Dye, Dye Street. Where's the Ryerson Street? It's our street. The other sign is on our street. We had no idea, but how God is so perfect. You know, uh, Brother Copeland, when I started sharing about the harbinger, all hell broke loose and we ended up losing our building. But then the Lord, it was all his plan. He brought us to the actual ground of the keeper of ground zero, Joris Ryerson, for the harbinger to go forth to the world. God is perfect. And that's the same land where the first great awakening, where the man prayed on that ground. Oh my goodness. There's no, there's, that's the other part we talk about, how God is in charge of everything. Yeah. It's redemption. It's talk redemption. about the great awakening and how that, how that well, well, out of there. Well, actually what happened well, is... that's where we are again. Yeah, we, that's where we're praying. And, that, that, and yeah, the, the, the man, you know, we know about Jonathan Edwards, I mean, we, we know about uh, George Whitehead at Whitefield and jo uh, Jonathan Edwards. But what the man who was the first, the one who, from whom it started, was a man named, it was the, and you'll see it if you look carefully, he was a Dutchman named Theodorus Freelingheisen, and he, he ministered in New Jersey. And, and actually, other people talk about him. He was the first one. You can look at it mm -hmm. in the 60s, around the time. And so he was Dutch. Joris Ryerson, the keeper of Ground Zero, was Dutch and a believer and a minister. And he, he opened up this new land, uh, replacing Ground Zero, and prayed and dedicated to God. Theodorus, Ryer, Theodorus Freelingheisen came to the land, worshiped there, prayed there with, with the two, the keeper of ground zero and this, they prayed together. I mean, Odali had a service and prayed for revival. And so, the, and the great awakening is linked they to that. Came. They right came. came. Right there. They came. They came. <laughs> and came. you're on that and, land. And we had no idea. Oh we my no, We had goodness. no idea. The reason we found out is one of the descendants of Joris Ryerson, the keeper of ground zero, got born again. And they said, I want to go to, a, I, you know, they were led, I, I'm going here. They came to our congregation. Want, they said, there's something about this land. I don't know what it is. They're wandering. They say, I don't know what it is. They discover that they are, they are not only the descendant of yours, Ryerson, but this was his land. And this is land. He was buried there. He, I mean, he was there. This is where he ministered. And it's, it's ground zero. Jonathan Kahn, how, now I tell you, what does God have to do I don't to know. say, hey, it's me. <laughs> I think, I think uh, you know, it says Jews demand a sign. <laughs> you know, so, you know, hallelujah. It started with a, we started with a train and I think God knows we need signs, you know, you know, and so, and God is so real. He never, he doesn't stop blowing me away. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I believe what I've just heard in my spirit on tomorrow's broadcast, I think you should give your testimony. Okay. We want to know about okay. that. All right. I know a little bit about it, but okay. I, I want to hear I want to hear it again. Pray I'll do it. God. Okay. Now, now let me tell you something now. You can see, you, you can see what God's doing. Whoever you are, you may say, well, you know, yeah, but I am so insignificant. What do I count for anything? Let me tell you something, sweetheart. There's no such thing as an insignificant human being. No, 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 no. Is there anything insignificant that God created? Well, then why am I in this big mess? No, that's not who you are. That's what and who you have become, which means you can become someone else. You can become, uh, you can get over into the plan of God so quick it'll make your head swim. God has a plan for your life. He has, he has a working around you. He has, a, he has a spiritual highway laid out for you. You are his workmanship. Well, Brother Copeland, how do I get in there? Well, first of all, if you don't know Jesus as Lord, you accept him right now. You say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I receive you. I repent of sin. I want to go your way. 
They're like, Gloria, the day she got saved, she'd never heard of that. She said, Jesus, take my life and do something with it. Praise God. Well, that is 54 years ago, and I'll tell you what he did, didn't he? Amen. So my point is this. I, I was at a time in this ministry, I, I, knew, I, was, I knew I had gotten off, the, off, off the perfect will of God some way. I, I, wasn't, I didn't know, how, but I was under conviction about it. I didn't know how, I didn't know what I had to do, and it really was bothering me. And I took off from some time and just went before the Lord and, and, and prayed and fasted. And I said, Lord, what do I do? Well, the, well, the first thing he said, do you believe just right in here. I didn't hear an audible voice or anything. Just right in here where every, every believer, if you listen, you can hear him. Do you believe I could take you by my supernatural power from where you are right now into the center of my will mm. like that? I said, but of course. He said, then pray, Lord, your will be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. I believe I receive it, and by faith mm. I take it. Mm. He said, now from that point, you just, you just begin to thank me. Thank you that I'm in your perfect will. Mm. Don't be troubled about it anymore. Mm. Now what happened, the more I said that, I could see where it thing, he kind of bumping me mm. over this way, and, but, mm. but the pressure was off. Mm. His desire is to put you in his will. Mm. Yeah. That's where we are right now. Pray that, God, your will be done in my life on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus, amen. Ah, this is so rich and so good. You've, you have talked about at least a twice this week about the train hitting you. <laughs> I want to hear the whole story. I, I want to I just give you testimony. I want, okay. I want to hear it all. Okay, but feel free to <laughs> come in here. Um, well, for, I'm born, you know, Jewish. I'm Jewish. I was born in a Reformed Jewish home. My father came, was, was, grew up under Hitler, and he was there, and when Hitler came to power, the German Jews sent their kids out. Yeah. And they sent him out on trains, and he came out. They sent him out, came to England. In England, they, they, when the war started, they rounded up all the Jews and the Germans, the, the Nazi, the German Jews, the German, they, all the Germans, Jew and Nazi, because they thought they might be spies. They rounded them all up. They rounded up my father, put them on a ship to go across the Atlantic to go into a prison camp in Canada. And he was literally on a, on a ship with Nazis as they went across the ocean. And the, the ship before him sunk. And so he went over, they put him in prison, they were in prison, uh, and after a while, you know, you know, you had the older Jewish people and the younger Jewish people, and they were, the older ones were teaching the, the younger ones an education. They used toilet paper to teach them, Come you know, on, like, like scientists teaching them. That's and, so, and so, you know, the Jewish people always like surviving, yes. you know. Amen. So, so, they, so finally the, the Canadians realized, wait a minute, these aren't war criminals. And the gra gradually he got out, education, science, became a scientist, came to America, met my mother. My mother's family escaped the Tsar of Russia. The, Rus the Tsar was saying, we're going to destroy all the Jews. Yeah. You know, a third of them will convert, a third of them will drive out, and a third of them will kill. And so they escaped, came to America. I mean, when you're Jewish, you're always escaping something. You know, it's always on the run. <laughs> and, and that's prophecy. God well, said yeah, it. God it said is. it. You know. That's right. So, so they came. So she ended up in Brooklyn, ended up, ended up becoming a scientist. They two met as scientists, got married, you know had three kids. I was, the, I was the boy, there was two girls, and so grew up in a reform uh, Jewish home. That means it's the least religious of the religious, you know, not orthodox, not conservative, reform. But I went to Hebrew school, you know, they sent me to Hebrew school, I was there all the time, and learning about God, the God, and I saw film strips of the prophets and, and you know, David and God moving and all that, and I, I loved that. But when I was about eight years old, I said, wait a minute, doesn't match up. You know, you have, I have the films, I have God moving, and, but God's not moving here. I don't see the God of the Bible here. I mean, it was liturgy and, you know, reading the thing, but nobody, nobody said, hey, God's in my life, or God did this for me. You know, the rabbi didn't get up and say, hey, God spoke to me today. It just didn't happen. I said, this doesn't go because this is what's in the, you know. So I said, all right, there's no God. It's all, it's all false. So I became an atheist when I was eight years old. 
So that atheist, now that lasted for a little while, but after a while I said, wait a minute, atheism doesn't work. I started losing faith in atheism. I said, it doesn't work. He said, there's gotta be something. There's gotta be a reason behind it. So I started seeking. I'm searching everything I could. I'm searching, I'm searching uh, you know, books on science, on religion, on the occult, on UFOs, Nostradamus, Chariots of the Gods, if you remember back then. And so I'm, I'm open, and you know, it's kind of God got me through the back door. I, I was an atheist, but now I started being open to more, and, but not the right way yet. But so one day I'm in the store and I look at a book and I, it looks like Chariot of the Gods. It looks like it's a UFO book. So I said, let me get this book. I get this book, God tricked me. <laughs> because it, it was the book he gave me. It was, it, the book was The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Oh, my. But they made that year, they made it look like a UFO book. And, you know, because that was, I mean, I thank God for those little quirks, you know. Sure. And so I picked it up and he said, he said is, this the, is this the generation that Jesus and Moses spoke about? I said, well, all right. Now I read about Jesus. You know, Jesus was in everything. You know, growing up Jewish, you know, we thought Jesus was cool. You know, I mean, I mean he, was, he was like a hippie, you know, growing up in the 60s. But it was, you know, Christianity in the church, we had a Catholicism we had a problem with, but Jesus, there was some cool, but didn't think he was Jewish. We thought he, or if he was Jewish, he converted and became Catholic. That's what we thought, you know. <laughs> so, but you know, the one thing you can never believe in as a, as a Jewish person is Jesus. You know, you can, you can be a Buddhist, you can be an atheist, you can be a communist, but the one time you believe in the Jewish rabbi Jesus, that's it, you know. I said, well, that's amazing. Jesus must be some special because he's the only one who could make a Jewish person not Jewish. That must be the Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you know, so, 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 so everybody's, so, you know, and, and whenever you read different things, they're all pointing to Jesus, all pointing to Jesus, you know, the, the Hindus point to, I mean, the Buddhists, but Jesus points to himself. So, so here I'm, re, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it because I was reading about Jesus. So I'm open, I'm, I'm telling my friends, I'm, I'm a teenager now. I'm telling my friends about the second coming, about Israel. You know, it was all about what the Bible said is coming true. Sure. Israel has to come back. It's back. Jerusalem is all back. So I'm saying, wow, I never knew anything about this. So I'm telling my friends, I'm not saved, but I'm leading them to the Lord. I'm <laughs> winning them to the Lord. So I'm winning them. They were one after the other. And I'm literally, but, you know, I'm, but I'm living as a teenager. I, I had a rock band and, and, you know, did what a teenager does and all that. And I didn't want to give that up. I remember, I remember being in speech class. You had to give a speech in high school. And I, I, I preached the whole time. I preached about the second coming, about the end time prophecy. I'm preaching as a Jewish person. You're but, still doing it. I'm still doing it, but, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not, I'm, but I'm, <laughs> maybe that was preparation, but, but, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm not, so but good. I still, but I don't want to give it up. Cause I think if you give up, if you, if you, if you go to the Lord, you give up everything good, you check in, you join a monastery, check in, and that's the end of your life. So I said, Lord, I know you're the truth, because as it's going on, I'm saying, wait, it's not just not Nostradamus, that doesn't work, only the Bible, everything it said has come true. And so then it's like, it's like the Lord, it's not just, you can't just talk about this, Jonathan, he's coming back and you're not right with him. So, so I, I said, okay, Lord, I know I have to get right, but I don't want to get right, because I don't want to do that, you know? So I want to keep doing what I'm doing. So I made a deal with God, you know, and it's very Jewish to make deals with God, you know? So I made a deal with God, except, <laughs> except he's a lot better than we are. So, so I made a deal and I said, God, if you give me a long life, I'll accept you when I'm on my deathbed. That was, that was the, the deal. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna live a long life, and then when I'm finished, I'll follow God, you know, when I'm about to die. So what happened is, soon after I made that deal, I was almost killed twice. The first time I'm in a car with a guy who I was part of leading the Lord, and we almost get killed, a car accident, almost get killed. It was miraculous that we didn't get killed. Okay, but it didn't, all right. But then a few months later, I'm in a Ford Pinto, which used to blow up on impact, yeah. you know? And I'm, I'm, cross, I'm heading to a train track at night, and the light is going on like the, you know, like the train's coming, but all the other cars are crossing. So I said, well, maybe it's broken. So let me go up. So I kind of go, I go up and let me see if it's coming. I look and I see a light and the light is the train, but it didn't look like it was moving much because it was coming head on. I'm on the track. I didn't, I didn't realize I was on the track. It was a dangerous intersection. There was no, no protection. And it was on an angle on a rough, on a bumpy road and people had been killed on that track. So I'm on the track waiting for the train. Um, and, you know, last minute I said, you know what, maybe just to be safe, maybe I'm too close, just to be safe. So let me try to back up a little. So I'm, try, so I'm going to back up, but I look in the, now there are headlights in back of me, you know, and the train's coming, headlights in back. So I said, well, let me just back up like a foot. I, I'm just being safe. So I back up a foot. I'm, I'm still in the path of the train. So I'm waiting for the train to come. The train comes and plows into the Ford Pinto. The, the car goes up like aluminum foil. The only thing I could get out of my mouth at that moment was call out to God. It's the only thing I can do. I called out to God 
and the car is destroyed. And I didn't get a scratch. Oh my goodness. I didn't get a scratch. It made the headlines, all this stuff. The police came out of the car and, uh, and I said, Lord, I said, can we renegotiate? <laughs> can we renegotiate? Let's and, redo yeah, this deal, right? Please, now. <laughs> please, because, you know, I said, give me a long life, but that life was coming, you know, that my death day was coming very shortly. I said, like, and I, and I was literally, you know, people come to the Lord for, for good reasons, all that. And, and for me, listen, I mean, it doesn't matter how you come. I was afraid of going to hell. You know, I realized that, that within inches or within yeah. an inch, that was my eternity. I, that was it. And I was afraid if I, if I keep going, I mean, there was a, there was a car, then it was a train. It's going to be, it's going to be an asteroid, something, meteorite, something's <laughs> going to happen. My, you know, he's a, my, I'm numbered, you know? So I said, Lord, I said, let's make a new deal, please. A new deal. And here's the new deal. If you, I'll accept you now when I turn 20. Just, just don't kill me until I turn 20. That was, that was my deal. So, and it was about, it was about eight months, nine months away. So, so what happened was like a man who, like a, like a man whose time was up, like it was a contract. It was like, he came to my 20th birth and he said, okay, you know, I gave you my word. I didn't know how to get saved. Nobody was leading me. I didn't know what to do. I, you know, I remember Hebrews, what I remember from Hebrew school is that Elijah met the Lord on a mountain, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and God met Moses on a mountain. So let me find a mountain. So I, I look around for a mountain. You know, so I find a mountain, it's night. I go to get up to the top of the mountain. I get on the top, that's when I told you, I see this tower, it says Tower of Babel. I said, you know, that's my life, I don't want that. I, I go over, I find a rock, a flat rock near a tree, I kneel down and I said, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what I'm doing, I don't have, you know, but I'm giving my life to you. I put my faith in you, just take it from there on in. That's how I came to the Lord because of that locomotive train. If it wasn't for that train, I wouldn't be saved. I thank God for the train. You know, it says Jews demand signs. I needed a train. That's what it, that's, that's what, because we're stuck, we can be stubborn. You know, and, and from that moment, I remember that first thing I said, okay, now what, I, you know, I said, you know, I thought, I thought when you come to the Lord, because people have been coming, I've been talking about people and they were coming to the Lord, you know, and one of them said when they came to the Lord, it was like lightning came through them, you know. I said, so Lord, I thought so, like you, you prayed to the Lord and something happened, like a bell rings or something says, you know, number 503, you know, gets in, you know, <laughs> I, I thought the gig, there's some sign. <laughs> and and I, didn't see, I didn't see a sign, you know, and, and I, and I, but I realized that first week it was like there was a presence within me that I couldn't curse anymore. Oh, yeah. I couldn't, there was something, it was like having a jacket on you that you never had before. Yeah. And, 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 you know, then you get used to it, it's on you. But, and my life started changing. Now, now my, my parents, you know, were not happy. You know, they didn't want to hear about Jesus. You know, I mean, you're Jewish, you're raised, that's the one thing and you can't, you can't yeah. believe in Jesus. But the thing is that, but they liked the effect of Jesus. They liked the, the sign of Jesus. They liked what happened to me because it was Jesus. You know, that was really, But the thing is, you know, I was called after this, talk about like mysteries and how God speaks. I was called later on, you know, I was called to go to the, the nations and I, w I would always end up being called to go up a mountain. I mean, always, like, you know, and it usually was a, a witchcraft mountain, voodoo mountain, some, and some supernatural thing happened on the top of the mountain. We're gonna, but something was happening. Well, the time came, it was my anniversary in the Lord, and I said, you know, it was my birthday. I, you know, I got saved on my birthday. I said, let me, let me go back, let me visit that mountain again. So I go up the mountain at night. This time I bring a, a, a Trump a shofar and a, a shawl, you know, and a Bible and a flashlight. And I find the, the, the stone where I gave my life to the Lord. And I'm just praying and I, I open the Bible and just, it just, op just happened open to where Jacob returned to the place where he found the Lord, you know, Bethel. But then I said, okay, that's interesting. And I just opened again and, and it, says, it opens to a scripture. It says, the enemy says, I have your mountains, Israel. I said, that's weird. I'm on a mountain, you know. But then I had a great time, blew the shofar. Next day I'm in church, I'm in the congregation, Beth Israel. And at the end, somebody's waiting for me online with a present, a gift. And it's a woman. And it says, you know, we know it's your birthday. So we have a, and they bought a, a picture. It's a drawing they bought of a man blowing a shofar with a talit on top of a mountain. I said, that's weird. I said, because that was me last night. I said, this, this was my anniversary in the Lord. It's my birthday. And they said, really? I said, yeah, I got saved on a mountain. And the woman says, what mountain? I said, well, you don't know the mountain. I don't know the mountain. I just, I know where it is. But he said, no, no, what mountain? I said, well, I described it for her. And the woman says, the woman says, I live at the bottom of that mountain. I said, really? She said, do you know what that mountain is? I said, no. She said, that mountain's dedicated to Satan. I said, really? I said, I got saved on the top. She said, that's where they gather. I said, really? I said, I, I kneeled down on the rock and gave my life to the Lord. They said, that's the altar. And here's the thing, brother, here's the thing. I remember when I was there on the mountain and I saw words in graffiti that said, no Jew shall enter these sacred grounds. And I said, 
who on earth, what Nazis are, who would write that? Satan worshipers, Satan would write that. And it hit me, I said, you know what? For 2,000 years, Satan has been trying to keep the Jewish people from their Messiah. He's been trying to keep the Jewish people this from that true. mount. Yeah. He literally is on that mountain in Jerusalem. I mean, here's where salvation comes. You know, it, was the mount, it was the mountain of my salvation. You know? And the enemy was trying everything he could. He's tried everything he could to keep them because he knows when the Jewish people come back to him, that's it. Yeah. When he comes back yeah. to the Messiah, yeah. that's it. That's so it. he tried to do, so he's tried everything. And I said, you know what, too late, Satan. I'm in, I'm in. You know? and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and it's after that. And, and I realized the whole big picture you know, you have the Temple Mount. You know, that's where Jesus is coming. That's where he's going to reign. And the enemy puts up that mosque, puts up to this, my mountain. The enemy says, I have your mountain. This is the enemy. The enemy will always, I mean, you know this, I'm preaching the choir, but the enemy will always try to put a blockage on God's sure. promise. Yeah. You have God's promise, God's land, and he will always try to put that there. But the thing, I mean, the key is, you know, when the, when the, when the Jewish people first came to that land, it was, there were enemies in there, they had a fight, and we have to fight for the promise. The promise is given, the promise is given, it's given, but we have to take the land. We have to take that land. You know, the enemy tried for 2,000 years to stop the Jewish people. He tried to, he tried to wipe them out. He's, I mean, that's, that's the secret. That's why the world has tried to destroy them. No people have had everything against them like they have. He's tried everything he could for 4,000 years to wipe them out, but he could not do it because the God of Israel is alive and well. The God of our Bible is powerful and mighty and nothing stops it. Every power that tried to destroy the Jewish people is gone. Every empire has fallen, but Israel, the weakest little nation on earth, has survived them all yeah. because, it is because the God of Israel is real. The word of God, when God makes a promise, he keeps it. Even if it takes, even if it's 2,000 years, if he keeps that, Amen. he doesn't forget the 2,000 years, he's not gonna forget the promises to us. God is real and nothing stops it. And he's promised also, before the end of the age comes, the Jewish people are coming back. We're coming back. This is part of his prophecy. This is part of the sign that he's alive, that he's coming back and Amen. that he's coming soon. And it's right now. Amen. I believe it, it with is. all my heart. It is. It is. No nation, you know, we believers for ages have prayed, oh Lord, that we could see the day that Israel would come back, would be alive. You said, and a lot of people gave up on the word of God. A lot of people said, you know, this is never happening. He's never bringing them back. You know, it's all spiritual. It's all spiritual. It's all the church replaced Israel. No. God said it, and then, and, and you know, no matter what, God, did, God didn't go along with the plan. You know, God said, I'm going to bring them back. He did. You want to, that's what took me from an atheist to believe in, in God. He said it. He did it. He said he'd give them Jerusalem. He did it. He said the whole world will be focusing on Israel. It is. Yes, he said it the is. world will be against Israel. It is. But he said, as long as the stars are in the high, as long as the sun and the moon are there, as long as it's there, Israel shall not pass away from being a nation before me. They are my witnesses. As long as God is, they're there because God is real. We've the only, we have the only God you know, in the world who's the only God who has the witness of God of, in history that he is so real. Now, that, but that brings us right back to the harbingers. Yeah. That brings us right back to the mysteries. It, the, the uncanny timing and detail of all of that, that's... In, yes. in my heart and mind, that's the reason he's done this, yes. because it is absolute evidence. Yes. He, you know, you were talking before off the air, but, you know, to think of for one prophecy to come true, for one prophecy, I mean, just think Mary and Joseph, you know, you know, they had to be the exact people. They had to be born from the two exact people who fell in love before yeah. them and who fell in love before them. And everything in the world, you know, everything in the world's connected. You know, every event in the world, it's called the, the butterfly effect. Every single thing affects everything else. So every event in the world had to come be an exact place for the prophecy to come true. And that's not just true in then, it's true now. Israel came back, that's prophecy. That means everything in the world, in our lives, in our grandparents' lives, everything had to be in its place for God to do it. He's the God of every detail. And here we sit. Yeah. <laughs> here we are. We're, we're part By of that detail. Grace. Isn't it awesome? You're part, you're <laughs> part of that detail. Th this is what just so, ha and it just has me so stirred up in my, in my spirit and in my soul. We are part of this detail working of the spirit of God right now. What you pray counts. Mm -hmm. What you think counts. What you do counts. And it'll count on one side or the other. You can't just go off and just do any old thing you want to do without it counting for destruction. Mm -hmm. It's all part 
of a woven network mm. of destruction that Satan's been trying to do mm. all this time. And every negative word, every cursed expression that goes forth is all detail of that. But the moment you made Jesus Christ Na mm. of Nazareth your Lord and Savior, boom, your whole part of it just exploded in his face. Mm. And now, here we are pulling on heaven. Our prayers count, glory to God. What we pray means something to God. And when we mm. call on him, we, we, we intercede for this outpouring. You're interceding for your family. Mm. An intercessor is one that stands in the gap. There was a time when God said, I have no intercessor. Mm. Can you imagine a whole world, nobody interceding? Mm. Mm. But God took care of it. Yes. And now look at it. There's not just one of us or two of us or 50 of us or a million of us. We're, there's tens of millions of us yeah. all over this world pulling on heaven, man. Yes. Oh, oh glory Watch, to watchmen. God. He says, watchmen, don't give up. Don't, don't, don't quit. Don't, don't quit and keep reminding God until he makes Jerusalem a praise. You know, uh, there's something about the praisers. Yeah. When Jehoshaphat, yes. all this big enemies coming. Yes. You know, I thought for a long, long time that that God told him to put those singers up there, but he didn't. Mm. Jehoshaphat inquired of the people, mm. and they decided we're going to praise God. Mm. It's his battle and our victory. Yes. Can you imagine what each one of those guys thought <laughs> yes. when they're out there in front <laughs> yes. of this and they're, they're in their own mind? You know how the devil yes. works. In their own mind, they're thinking, man, I hope this works. <laughs> That's yes. a sacrifice of praise. <laughs> yes. They were sacrificing yes. themselves. Yes. They're believing this is going to work, That's right. but this battle not over yet. That's right. That's right. The armies of Israel and the praise is a weapon. And I mean, I know you know this, but, and the word Jew, it says we are spiritually, we are all spiritually yes, Jewish. Yes, we are. And the word means the praiser of God, Yehuda, of one who praises God, one who gives thanks That's to God. That's who we are. And it comes from, it comes from the, the root word Yod, which is an open hand that praises God is also the hand that receives the blessings oh, from God. That is, say it again. The, the, for the word for Jew is one who praises God. If you are a spiritual, you are the one who praises God no matter what. And the word Yehudi comes from Yad, which means a hand, the open hand. The open hand of praise is the same hand that receives the blessings the from God. The Yeah. That's what yeah. Oh, yeah. glory yeah. to God. Yeah. Yes. Whoa. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Let's do it. Oh, <laughs> Praise hallelujah. The Lord. Praise oh, the Lord. we receive hallelujah. it, Lord. We Praise take it Father. by faith Father. in the name yes. of Jesus. And we're out of time. We'll be back in just a moment. Is it possible that an ancient mystery exists that has been determining the course of your life without you knowing it? That has forecast the rise and fall of the world's stock market throughout modern times and that holds the key to understanding what lies ahead for believers and the nations of the world? Unlocking the End Time Mysteries Package is a powerful collection of historic and prophetic accounts from best-selling author Jonathan Kahn. Featuring the Harbinger book, the Harbinger Dakota DVD, and the Mystery of the Shemitah book and DVD combo set. There is a divine connection between Old Testament prophecy of ancient Israel and modern day events in America and around the world. There is a biblical link in Isaiah between judgment and blessing. What side will you be found on? Understand end time events. Order Unlocking the End Time Mysteries package today for only $42.95, a savings of 30%. Go to kcm.org slash TV special or call or write today. If you are born again, you are a fellow citizen of Israel. Don't be intimidated by the events happening around you. Go deeper into God's word and become vessels of his light and love. You have the power to touch the world for God. Receive the information you need to face the future with confidence. Order the Unlocking the End Time Mysteries package today at kcm.org slash TV special or call 800-600-7395 or write today. No born again believer has any reason to be frightened about any of this, nothing. But 
If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's time to take care of that right now, right this moment. Now listen to these words. If you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture said, Whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now, pray this prayer with Rabbi Khan and me. Pray it out loud where you can hear it with your own ears. Jesus has done all the hard part. The one thing he can't do, never will be able to do, is pray your prayer for you. You have to make the decision and pray that yourself. The rest is waiting for you right now. Pray this, O oh God in heaven, yes, God. I believe with all my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus, from the dead. Jesus come into my heart. I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. I repent of sin. I renounce it. I renounce the devil and everything he stands for. And you, Lord Jesus, are my future. I'm asking you to fill me now with your precious Holy Spirit to overflowing. I fully expect to speak in other tongues just like they did on the day of Pentecost. And I receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Scripture says you are born from above, born of the Spirit. You're now a citizen of heaven. So we want to send you this little book, free and postpaid, to help you get started studying your Bible. This, this book, you don't need to be uh, struggling with this book, and this will help you get started. Praise God. We'll see you again tomorrow. I'm so glad you did that. You just got to let us know now. Use the information there on your screen. or not, but you are an overcomer. That's who you are. That's what you are. You're a whosoever and a whatsoever. That's who you are, and that's what you are. You're a world overcomer, and you've got the faith with which to overcome it. Brother Copeland is literally talking to me, and, and it's just overwhelming. You just sense that you're, you're being ministered to directly. Well, faith is the answer. Faith secure. Faith has contact with God. God can fix anything. But if you come and get into a meeting like this, the Word of Faith will really, really build you up and God will really speak to you so that you can know your place and your destiny and your call in the body of Christ. The spirit realm is so close to earth when you are in this atmosphere. can just walk right in the door and the anointing will meet you and greet you right at the door. The atmosphere is uh, glorious and it gets better and better. The presence of God is here. Coming here is being refreshed. And I know I'm being changed just from being here. is a day of significant and unusual miracles. The grace of God belongs to us. We're healed. We're well. I don't care what you did yesterday. Your healing is here today. Hallelujah. We take our healing. Hallelujah. 
Now it's time you found out who you are in Christ Jesus and start acting like it. I want to fight a good fight and I want to keep the faith. Hallelujah. Well, in the United States, I have multiplied millions who have not bowed their knee to darkness. I have multiplied millions that are walking by faith, that are living in the, the, the life of faith and the life of goodness, and they are coming alive like never before. These are victorious days. Friday is always offering day on the Believer's Voice of Victor broadcast. And beginning with the sixth verse, let him that is taught in the Word communicate or respond unto him that teaches in all good things. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. And that's what we've been talking about all week. God was mocked mm -hmm. by what they did, and He was mocked by what we did. And glory to God, His power and His grace and His mercy is overcoming that. That's so rich. Now, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The word life there, the Greek word zoe, the very, the very essence of the life of God. Father, I pray over this offering, and I'm asking you to reveal to each one of us what our part of this offering is. We sow it in response of your Word, and the words of your messenger that you sent to us. And in return, we receive our every need met, spirit, soul, body, financially, and socially. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Now, whatever the Lord tells you to do, do it. But do it in faith and do it expecting your day of outpouring. Glory to God. Amen. This is so rich and so good. Now, you, got, you, you know now what I'm going to tell you to do. Go to church this weekend. I mean, cause a revival or a riot or something. I mean, seek God and choose to believe His Word. If you missed any of the broadcasts this week, you know what to do. Go to kcm.org or on the Roku channel, our, our place on the Roku, the Roku channel, <laughs> praise God, and go back over these things again and again and again. It's so good. It's been wonderful. We'll see you next time. Until then, remember this, Jesus, Jesus is, is Lord. Lord. Kenneth Copeland Ministries is here for you. Watch the Believer's Voice of Victory anytime on our website, kcm.org. Remember to download your free copy of the study notes at kcm.org notes. You'll have access to all the scriptures, prayers, and key teaching points for each of the broadcasts. Continue to grow in the Word with this week's product offer. Be sure to order yours today. Build your faith with these Word-based teaching materials. Jesus has opened the door for your victory. Come to a Kenneth Copeland Ministries event. Jesus said, have faith in God. Well, that we, we agree with that. That is the key. I need wisdom, have faith in God. I need to hear from God, have faith in God. I need to know what to do, have faith in God. Because see, the information's already yours and it's already on the inside of it. April 7th through 9th, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland welcome you to the 2016 Branson Victory Campaign at Faith Life Church in Branson, Missouri. April 22nd and 23rd, get connected at the 2016 Living Victory Chicago Faith Encounter with Kenneth Copeland and Kelly Copeland Swisher in Chicago, Illinois. July 4th through 9th, join Kenneth and Gloria Copeland and their special guests for the 2016 Southwest Believers Convention in Fort Worth, Texas. August 19th through 20th, get involved at the 2016 Living Victory Anaheim Faith Encounter with Kenneth Copeland and Kelly Copeland Swisher in Anaheim, California. Created exclusively for the partners of Kenneth Copeland Ministries, the online partner community, a safe place to meet and connect with other KCM partners. Go to kcm.org and click on community. Log in and enjoy a social experience sharing with other believers who have the same foundation of faith. It's easy to use with lots of features and fun. Meet and have conversations with other KCM partners around the world. Encourage and build each other up 
share your testimonies. Kenneth and Gloria Copeland pray for their partners every day. Here's a great way to pray for one another. You can also fellowship with other KCM partners who share similar interests and goals. God never meant for us to be alone. The online partner community brings us all together. Visit kcm.org and check out the online partner community today and see what a difference being connected makes.